Baruch Hashem, you're a bad Jew. Shalom. Welcome back to another episode of Bad Jew. We are now entering the third week during the Israel-Hamas war of 2023, which means that the tone of this podcast has completely shifted. It has caused me to pivot. I'm telling you, everyone right now, that I had two months of content pre-recorded, ready to go, answering questions from my community, and then suddenly all that became irrelevant under what's currently happening. And so now we've adjusted and we've been doing topics that have been related to the Israel-Hamas war happening right now. And with us today to shed more light and to uh, give a more dynamic view of uh, what's happening in the world with uh, Jews is Izzy Salant. Izzy, welcome to Bad Jew. How are you doing today? Uh, it's a lot. Just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, every day is just, you learn more and more every day. You know, things get slightly easier and slightly harder. And at the end of the day, our job is just to make sure that everybody knows what's happening. So I'm here. You're here indeed. And, you know, I've been doing a for those who don't know, Izzy Salant is a, actually a personal friend of mine, but he's also an incredibly informed guy. He has a journalism background. He has a writer's background, uh, an acting play of a background. And you're going to hear more about that in a second. Uh, you know, outside of this personal view, though, Izzy has had uh, a certain sense of authority or rising authority in the space. And, you know, he currently works for JNS. He's, he's going to talk about uh, a, a lot of the what's happening in the Jewish world from a, a digital landscape perspective. And I'm, I think that's actually a really important aspect to consider. We're going to talk more about that in a second. But before we begin, there is a right of entry onto this podcast, and that is the four minute bad Jew challenge telling your life story in four minutes. Are you ready? I am ready. Excellent. Echad, Steim, Shalosh, Yalla. Great. So, oh, you're going to hold the timer up the whole time. Oh, I do. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, I was born in Rockville, Maryland uh, to two wonderful parents. Uh, you know, I was born in a conservative Jewish household. I still identify as a conservative Jew. Uh, as I grew up, my dad basically was very much, uh, very much got on me to make sure that I had a good Jewish education. But once I turned 13, his biggest idea was, you know, you can do what you want with your Judaism right now. You know, you can, you know, you're bar mitzvahed. So obviously we still want you to go to high holidays. We still really want you to attend services when you can. Uh, if you need to say your site, you know, we want to come with us, but you don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to religious school. You don't have to do all this other stuff. You can choose what you want on your own Jewish path. And so I did. Uh, and that was kind of what I had found Judaism for myself. It's why I've stayed the conservative Jew. Uh, in high school and in college and in middle school and everything, I also found a huge love for theater and performing. So I decided when I was going to go to school, I was going to study theater. Uh, but my rule was I had to go to a, a four-year state university. Lucky for me, my father's insane. And so that was anywhere from North Carolina to Maine uh, within driving distance. And I decided on the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So I studied theater and I studied journalism. And I fell in love with every aspect of it. I used to do a lot more acting. Now I do a lot more writing. Um, and when I got to college, I said, you know, I'm going to take a little break from my Jewish identity for a second. And that lasted about two months. Uh, and then I moved into my Hillel where I lived for three and a half years. Uh, and so I just had, you know, a fun college experience, made a lot of friends, uh, really came into myself, really discovered my passion, not only for Jew Judaism and Jewish education, but for writing and acting and theater. Uh, and then after college, I was the Hillel at UCLA Springboard Fellow. So I moved out here, graduated in May, and moved here in June 2019, lived here through COVID, uh, moved from being the at Springboard Ezra Fellow to the Director of Visual Marketing at Temple Emanuel Beverly Hills, to the Director of Visual Marketing at Lost Tribe, uh, did some agency work for a bit, and now I am a Digital Marketing Manager and uh, journalist for JNS Jewish News Syndicate. And that is why I'm here today. I don't know if you can hear... Uh, my Slack going off right now during this because I'm, you know, people are contacting me for this. So I will be uh, just here today to kind of talk about what we're going to be doing and uh, about the remnants of social media. I got slightly distracted from the from the Slack going off. I realized I still have a minute and thirty seconds, so we can fill in some other aspects of it. But I'm going to say cool, calm, and collected. So. Another aspect about me is I'm a magician, if you couldn't tell by looking at me in general. Uh, I picked up magic when I was in eighth grade, and I just never stopped. That's a lie. I did stop for a couple of years. I was doing magic for a while and then kind of gave it up for a bit and kind of gotten back into it. 
But overall, I'm just a theater loving script writing magician with two bachelor's degrees, one in theater and one in journalism, who writes stories that needs to be told and now works stages in the Jewish world, but now works in Jewish and Israeli media. And I'm here today to just discuss what is happening. And I'm happy to be here. Um, Chaz, we still have 40 seconds. So if you want to spend those 30 seconds describing our friendship, I want to see if you can do that. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Izzy and I met one time randomly at a Jewish organization uh, called H Lit. And then from an inside joke, almost within 24 hours, I invited him over to my house to go apple picking. And it's been history ever since. It's been uh, incredible to watch our friendship blossom. At one point, we were roommates. Uh, and since then, I, I think we've just had an incredible friendship. We stayed friends even through the pandemic in the virtual space. And today, he now lives down the street from me, which is really, really incredible. I am about to move, which is really heartbreaking. But no less, I am really, really excited to continue our friendship. Boom. Boom. Let's go. There we go. Uh, that was really hard to do. You put me on the spot there. That was great. Oh, um, I put you on the spot? Guy who does this every single podcast to every one of their guests? First of all, I already did my own four-minute ba four badge you challenge. And second of all, I forewarned you on what was to be expected on this show. So don't at me with that, okay? In the moment, you know, you think you have it and you want to make sure you get everything. And then you realize <laughs> kind of what certain important parts are that you need to hit. It almost feels like screenwriting or playwriting where you right. want to tell the whole story and then you go back and then you get the major plot points and that's what matters. And that's the bulk of the story. I left out a lot of other aspects. Like I went to Japan this year, but I didn't think that that necessarily mattered within my life story. No, no. I, I you, you, There are definitely a lot of juicy details that as people get to know you better, they will learn. And I do recommend getting in touch with Izzy because he's a wonderful guy. I'll also say that you are the first magician to be on this podcast and it was actually intended. It's actually one of the long list of questions from my bad Jew WhatsApp community that came, which is do Jews believe in magic? And we do. Uh, so we want to record an episode about that. If you are a speaker or if you know speakers that can speak about the Jewish experience of magic, please do email me at badjewpod at gmail.com. You can also be in touch with my community, the bad Jew WhatsApp community. Email me there and we'll go ahead and promptly add you to the WhatsApp community. In the meantime, though, we do have an episode to talk about. It's uh, certainly a somber, sombering. Uh, it's, it's certainly a sobering tone uh, in this, in this, with everything happening in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Uh, literally, as we are talking, the raids are now beginning. The, uh, you know, the the infiltration is now beginning, which is really important, but also very scary. And so, it's a turbulent time for our people. Mm -hmm. But there is a physical war happening right now. The literal war, the one with bullets and rockets and Iron Dome and border clashes and whatnot. There's also the information war. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And what I can tell you right now on a personal level that the Jewish experience, whether or not you are a supporter of Israel, is that people come up to you and expect you to be some kind of an advocate for the Israel Whatever, whatever crisis is happening in Israel in that moment, they come to you not knowing your stance on it, expecting you to have answers. And that exists in person. And that also exists primarily in the social media space. And Izzy, who is working heavily on social media, who gets a fresh cup of Hamas leaked videos of, of horrible beheaded sites and you know bloody gory imagery in the morning, is going to be talking about that. And um, that's why it's also important to check on the mental health of all your friends in this time. But Izzy, the question of this episode, does social media target Jews? That is such an, a broad question. I'm glad we're talking about it. And the answer is yes, because social media targets everybody. The whole point of social media, especially in ads, especially in specifically targeted ads, in how the algorithm works, in how everybody works on social media with the posts they're doing, with their hashtag strategies, with their tagging strategies, with their content, target specific audiences, right? And targets people based off of who is more likely to see your content. If you're able to break through, that's how things go viral rather than it's staying within those own echo chambers and within those own communities. Now, the question you're asking is specifically targeting as in, does it feel like it's ganging up and attacking. And a lot of times we can feel that way, especially whenever something has to deal with Israel or whenever something has to deal 
with something going on in the Jewish community. Social media is a wonderful place for an exchange of ideas, for people to showcase themselves, for people that may not otherwise be able to break into any industry, such as artists and actors and singers, to be able to put themselves online and make full livings with their with otherwise being unable to break into those industries before. How many singers have you seen that have beautiful voices but would never be able to get a record deal because they're not able to make it to LA or they don't know the right people? And now they're famous because their song blew up on TikTok. How many artists could never hope to get into art school because they didn't have the funding or they didn't have the training or they didn't weren't able to fill out an application and now make a living just doing art based off commissions from social media? Social media can be a wonderful place for those types of people to exist. It also, as we all know, can be a breeding ground and a cesspool for racism, anti-Semitism, prejudice, and misinformation. And especially when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, people suddenly become Middle East experts. And we've seen this currently, where people are sharing constant infographics, not made by reputable sources. I'm not talking about the ones made by JNS or Honest Reporting or the Times of Israel or the ones put out by state departments or the IDF or the ones put out by professors of both sides of the conflict. I'm not talking about the people that are actively educated on this, that are using social media to not only leverage their platform, but to provide information. I'm talking about the people that have read maybe two articles from a random source, make an infographic or make a comment, and it goes 100 100% viral. I'm talking about influencers who may want to speak up on behalf of either community, but aren't educated enough to fully take a stand. And honestly, you should never stand with terrorism. I can't believe that that has to be an argument that's being said. But regardless, people that don't fully know what they're talking about or don't necessarily have enough history or understanding to really weigh in on it, actively weighing in more than, hey, I support Israel's right to defend itself, or I'm sorry for all the loss of life that have happened, or this is terrible what Hamas did to Israelis, or I pray for the Palestinian loss of life and God, whatever their reasoning. Any more than that, if someone is offering their actual take on it, they are kind of saying, even if they're un, even if they're not intending, that they know more than the people who have dedicated their lives or have had numerous amounts of research and history into thousands of years of geopolitical conflict. And your cousin's Instagram story isn't going to solve the conflict. Correct. Correct. And I also want to say that, you know, in terms of influencers that are, that should be recognized for having a very positive impact and saying the right things in this time, SNL's Pete Davidson, when he opened up SNL during the week when everything started, he gave a very heartfelt, very brief opening, very different tonality than the other SNL episodes that have been out there. Uh, than the cold opens that are typically done where he just said, you know, like as someone who grew up without a dad, this is how comedy impacted me. And I feel bad for every child who is going through this right now that's caught in this. So he came from an empathetic place mm -hmm. and other people are suddenly deciding in their limited 30 characters that they're able to put into a comment that they're suddenly able to solve the entire conflict. Speaking of infographics and memes and things that go viral, here's an image that has been fluctuating throughout Twitter, or sorry, excuse me, X, that people have been just gravitating towards. I, you know, there's this image describing left versus right politics, showing the Russian flag, the Ukrainian flag, and also the uh, Palestinian flag and the Israeli flag, right? But the question is, is this accurate? And I think people at first glance assume it's accurate, but Izzy, what's your take on this graphic? So here's the thing. I don't know where this graphic came from. I've definitely seen this around Twitter, but I haven't necessarily seen, you know, where the sources are or where it originated from. And the fact of the matter is, upon first glance, this would lead people to believe that the left overwhelmingly supports Ukraine and the right does not support Ukraine and the right overwhelmingly supports Israel and the left overwhelmingly does not support Israel. And the fact of the matter is it depends on one who you're talking to and where your data and pollsters are coming from. While people have attacked the Democratic Party numerous times for their stances on Israel, and especially currently people are attacking, you know, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib uh, and other members of the squad and other members of, you know, progressive movements within the Democratic Party for their current stances on Israel and for their either failure to condemn what has happened or their late condemnation of it and immediate condemnation of Israel's retaliation and of what is happening in Gaza and Palestinian territories, right? And the fact is, 
if you look at it from a larger outside perspective, you know, we currently have a Democratic president who has sworn his allegiance and has sworn his support for Israel. And people on both sides of the aisle, Republicans, Democrats, independents, everybody has at least come out and said, thank you for supporting that aspect of it. Right. You know, you have people that loved Trump in Israel and you have people who loved Obama in Israel. You have people on the Republican side who do not support Israel because they are incredibly far right. You have people on the Democratic side who do not support Israel because they're incredibly far left. You have plenty of people on both sides that do support Israel. I mean, the Senate is controlled currently by the Democratic Party, and they passed a bipartisan bill overwhelmingly in support of Israel and con and condemning Hamas. You have people that, for all intents and purposes, have supported Israel's right to exist from the beginning. It's just how they are criticizing it. Are they criticizing Israel due to Netanyahu's government? Are they criticizing Israel based off of being lenient on the Palestinians? Are they criticizing Israel or the Israeli government based off other policies? And that's where the debate kind of comes in. I know we're going to lead into this more, but that's one of the major problems with social media. I'm describing something right now about you look at a graphic and you need to look at all the context behind it. And there's no nuance on social media. It does not exist. The way that you argue in comments cannot be the same way that you and I are talking in person. Even if you are trying to read a comment with the best intentions, unless you know the person, ergo, they're not a stranger. You don't know what the inflection of their voice is. You don't know whether there's going to be a pause somewhere that may change their point. You don't know whether they've listened and understand. There's no active listening. There's no staring at someone and nodding and hearing that you understand. There's just reading comments. It's just an empty script of people yelling. And at the same time, if you're going to comment on articles, on posts, on something of that nature, you're already charged up. You're already coming from a place of, I need my voice heard on this specific platform. These aren't people that are necessarily reaching out to their friends and family or other individuals and spreading education or spreading nuance or actually talking about the conflict. They're people who are saying, I need to comment on this post right now. And if you're already coming from that, you're either charged or you're already polarized. And that's why there's really no nuance on it. Yeah, I think that with social media, it's a very black and white picture of who can make the most noise and who can leave the most comments and that's who wins. And honestly, it's it's a place for, like you said, a misinformation cesspool. I want to talk about misinformation in a second, specifically with the case study of the hospital that was bombed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I think we should I think we should take a deep dive into that a little bit here because that's a classic example of how things got overinflated really quickly. Remember, we're in something called the fog of war. That's an expression that honestly needs to be used more mm -hmm. because within this fog of war, actions take place but it's not clear what's actually taking place. And I didn't really say that in a very articulate way, but the bottom line is that when things are happening a mile a minute, it's impossible to actually have informed reactions as opposed to knee jerk reactions. And let's talk about that knee jerk reaction that the world had and also the lives that were impacted by that. Mm -hmm. Of course. Look, the other thing about social media, right, is that it allows people to express themselves in an immediate way to a large swath of people, right? Think about how many times in life something bad has happened to you and your immediate reaction is one of anger, one of scorched earth, one of just immediate fight or flight response. And after a day or a week or however time, after you've had time to calm down and look at the situation, you've been able to you know articulate yourself in a different way or you've been able to look at the situation in a different light or you've been able to express yourself in a different modality on social media that immediate reaction gets publicized and so everything that occurs in your mind all of your thoughts all of the immediate reactions to an event get put on the world for display after the atrocious Hamas terrorist attack, right? People were immediately expressing support for the families that were hurt by this tragedy and saying, how can we help? People were expressing sorrow and sadness and pain and suffering for all what was being inflicted on Israeli civilians and children and foreign nationals in Israel. And some people came out in immediate anger 
And some called, obviously, for the demolishment of Hamas, which is what Israel is doing right now. And obviously, you want to demolish terror organizations. And some people came out in active anger amongst all Palestinians. At the same exact time, plenty of people on the other side saw that this was happening and immediately labeled it as a defiant act of civil resistance and came out and said they were not only in support but there were professors that said they were exhilarated by it. There were people who posted on social media that they think all Israelis deserved it. I had someone contact me personally to tell me that anyone who served in the IDF rather than go to jail has it coming. And these are all terrible things. They're also reactionary. A lot of these people, a week removed after they've had time to calm down, while their actions are still unforgivable and unexcusable, realize that what they said in the heat of the moment is not necessarily their either actual view on the conflict or they did not have time to process what was going on, which is another side of social media. Everything is immediate. Let's talk about the hospital that you brought up, right? For those who don't know, I don't think anyone's living under a rock, but those who don't know, a hospital was, was bombed in Gaza. It was initially reported that the um, that the hospital was struck by an Israeli airstrike and it killed 500 people, according to the Gazan Health Ministry. One, the Gazan Health Ministry is run by Hamas. It's the words of a literal terrorist organization. Two, somehow, immediately after the attack, they somehow had a round number of the amount of casualties that existed, like, without any time to count. It was like the immediate thing. The stories were hospital hit by Israeli airstrike, 500 people dead. Somehow they were able to do that. And third, everybody picked it up. Everybody claimed that this was true. The New York Times reported it. The Washington Post reported it. Reuters reported it. All of these major media outlets reported this as, as fact. Now, am I saying that it is completely unprompted for Israel to attack anything in Gaza that may be civilian infrastructure? No, because Hamas stores their missiles in hospitals and schools and residential buildings, which is a war crime. You cannot do that, right? You cannot store military grade uh, weapons. You cannot have military bases that close to civilian infrastructure. But Hamas does that. Is it that far-fetched to believe that that would happen? No. However, the entire week that all of these atrocities were occurring, people were debating the nuances and the minutia of whether the babies were beheaded or just burned alive. People were debating whether the women were actually raped or whether they were just sexually assaulted. People were discussing the in detail, look, looking at every single word, trying to find some plot hole in Israel's side of the story where civilians were slaughtered and massacred and people were taken hostage and children were left without parents and parents were left without children and three generations of families were murdered and Holocaust survivors that survived the Nazis were killed by Hamas. They were debating every single detail. And yet the second that Gaza says, hey, a hospital blew up and Israel did it, no time. For due diligence, no time for verification. Everyone immediately latched onto it. And not only did Israel not blow up a hospital, but one, it was a failed Palestinian jihad rocket. Two, it didn't even hit the hospital, it hit the parking lot. And third, around 20 to 50 people died, according to a European Union investigation through a, for a French publication. Nowhere near the amount that was originally claimed. Now, media outlets are bringing back their story. They're retracting it or saying we were wrong. But at this point, the damage had been done because right. all they saw was that major outlets that people trust said Israel did this. And it didn't matter that later on people were updating it. It did not matter that people said, hey, we were wrong. Because by then, everyone had saw the article. By then, it had been shared hundreds of thousands upon millions of times. And that's where we are currently. And I also want to point out that this kind of misinformation is so dangerous, not just for, you know, if you want to claim the propaganda machine of each country and whatnot, it's so dangerous for the international community abroad, for both Jews and Muslims across the world. Hate crime rates have been going up for Jews. And also, I want to also call, you know, point out as well in solidarity 
with Muslims around the world. Muslims yep. that aren't even Palestinian, by the way. There are Arabs across the world who have been experiencing, you know, there was a there was a Palestinian boy who was stabbed in America by a right wing extremist and it's being investigated right now. So there's less details about it. But these crimes are happening and there have been riots as well. And there have been more rallies and there have been um, group searches. I, I forgot exactly what the term was, but in London, there were videos of people from a pro Hamas rally scanning the streets looking for Jews to lynch. And that's one of the most disturbing sentences I've ever had to say out loud on this podcast. <laughs> Right. And it's it's like, what year are we in? So this kind of misinformation is literally costing lives. And these news channels need to take a deeper sense of responsibility for the kind of information. I know that if it bleeds, it leads. But these these impressions that you're going to be making actually have an impact on civilians across the world. Well, so, and that's, that's something that we all know, like working for agencies, right? I've talked about how social media can spread a lot of misinformation. I'll go into some more examples in a minute, but I currently work in social media and journalism. I currently work for an agency and I run their social media channels when I'm on the clock. Obviously we have multiple people that are running it and we're a wonderful team and I love my coworkers. But the fact is like we are on social media and it's weird to cut through all the noise, but also there is a responsibility with all of the misinformation that can be disseminated on social media, it's important for social media channels of major news outlets, for people that are educated on what's going on, for people that people trust and people that have large followings to make sure that they're not spreading that misinformation. The job on social media is to influence the conversation with facts, with logic, with information that allows people to understand what is happening. My job as a social media manager for JNS is not to tell people exactly what they should be thinking. My job is to say, here are the facts. Here's what's happening. Here's some opinions by some, by some columnists, and you're welcome to read them. But my job is to say, this is the information. And from there, people can either make their own assumptions or people can understand what is happening. Because they're not in Israel. I'm not in Israel, but a lot of my team is. I'm not on the ground. I'm not serving in the IDF. I'm not in Gaza. I'm not in Sederot. I'm not in any of the kibbutzim. I'm not in Jerusalem. I cannot tell you exactly what it's like there, but I can give you a pretty good estimate because of what I'm posting, because of what I'm covering, because of the people that are there that are writing these stories. And the same thing is true for all these other major news outlets that have bureaus in Jerusalem, that have them in Gaza, that have people on the ground that are showing photos. But because of that, that is what people are seeing. The person in New York City that has no idea about the conflict and their only attachment to it is their friends have Palestinian flags in their Instagram bio. All they're seeing is what's on social media. People don't read news like they used to anymore. Most people get their news from social media. So they trust places like the New York Times or they go to Fox News for their news or they're using any of these other major news outlets. That's what they're seeing. And so it's our responsibility to make sure what we're saying is the truth. One of the big things on social media is how information gets shared and why it gets shared, whether it goes to the algorithm or whether it's because it has some content in it that knows that it will be shared consistently. What do I mean by this? Videos do really, really well on Instagram. On YouTube, specific thumbnails do really, really well. Different hashtag strategies do very, very well on different platforms, right? And one of the things that always does well is content that is charged and content that uses buzzwords that specifically get people riled up, right? As much as you can't have nuance in social media comments and you can't have nuance on social media, the reason these controversial posts do so well is because it gets people arguing and it gets people using charged language. You'll see all the time that a lot of the graphics or information that's being shared about what Israel is doing uses words like ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and genocide. One, most people don't have actual evidence to back this up. Two, you can criticize what Israel does and its treatment of Palestinians, but you have to be very careful with the language that you're using. And I've seen a lot of, specifically on the progressive side, people who are very, very careful with their language. I mean, we have a whole debate right now in this country about what language can be used, right? And then you have people yelling about PC culture and those other aspects. 
And they're very, very careful on what language they use to not offend anybody and not to make blanket statements. Yet when it comes to Israel, we see those blanket statements being made. They call out genocide. And the fact is, I've never heard of a genocide where the population almost quadruples in the past 50 years, right? I've never seen, I've never seen anyone talk about ethnic cleansing and also talk about the fact that there are no Jews in the Arab world that have all been forced to either come to Israel or become refugees or be absolved by other countries, that they were active, actively ethnically cleansed, right? I never... I always hear people talk about the different war crimes Israel might be committing without actually looking at what's happening, right? You look at what's happening in Gaza and everyone calls it collective punishment that Israel is evacuating the north of Gaza. It's not great that they have to evacuate it. I know all the Gazans are not happy they have to leave their homes, that their places are literally going to be bombed and there's going to be airstrikes. But when Hamas stores their missile systems in hospitals and schools and there's no actual military infrastructure to attack that isn't in residential areas, what is Israel supposed to do? Either A, warn all the civilians, which never happens in war, warn the civilians, tell them to get out, do all of the other aspects that no other country ever does when they attack a place, and evacuate them. Two, leave them there and attack anyway, and then more civilians die. Or three, do nothing and let Hamas get away and regroup and basically let the world forgive Hamas for the terrible atrocities they committed. When people use buzzwords, they need to be careful of what buzzwords they're going to be using and why they're using them. And especially from people that claim to be very, very careful and very poignant with the language they use. I have seen so much charged and blanket statement language that you would not use again for any other ethnic group or any other country or any other actions. Well said. Well said, Izzy. Now, a grand majority of the users who are listening to this podcast, listeners who are just personal users of social media, they're going to need to have the resources and the know-how for how to navigate misinformation from accurate information, what would you say are the best practices for making sure that you can go into the social media space as informed as possible? The best way is to see who's posting it and why they're posting it. There are so many people that claim to know the truth on both sides of the conflict, right? And both sides of the political spectrum. Wherever you lie on the political compass, there are people on all sides that claim to be the arbiters of truth on social media, that they uncovered the story that the New York Times would never say, that here's the behind the scenes of Fox that no one would dare publish to this day, right? And those people, unless they literally have credentials, are not the arbiters of truth. The person with four followers with a tread on me flag on their Instagram page is not going to be the person that you should be getting your news from. The person who has a free Palestine in their bio and has never not only taken a journalism class, but has never stepped foot outside of their apartment in Long Island, right, is not necessarily who you need to be getting your news from or where you need to be getting your infographics from. And the fact is, even people that you trust, you really need to see where they're getting their graphics and why they're getting their graphics. You've probably seen the map graphic hundreds of times shared over about the loss of Palestinian land from 1947 to modern day. And the first map is this giant swath of green Palestinian land and small Jewish settlements. The second is the UN partition plan, which again was not adopted by the Arabs. The third was after the 1967 war after, and then Israel gave back a lot of the land. And then it's the modern day uh, Israel, Jane, Samaria, Palestinian territories and Gaza, right? And clearly trying to show that like, you know, there's a lot of displacement, all of these other aspects of it. Some of the maps are true. The initial map, the the modern map, they're correct maps. The other maps are not only untrue, but also misinformation. And they all lack context. At the same time, you see things that are shared on the Jewish side. There was this rally at UPenn that had people chanting, you know, we want Jewish genocide, or that's what was shared. And everybody from here to Timbuktu was saying, look how terrible this is. I can't believe this is happening. This is what you mean when you are supporting the Palestinian people, right? 
It was this whole, whole debate around it. But they didn't say that. They said, we charge you with genocide. And people on both sides are disseminating this misinformation. So number one is, again, seeing where you're getting your news from. Number two is seeing what is being shared, right? If it's a blurry video or a video from a campus that does not have like good subtitles, it may not be true. If it's a random map on an Instagram story from someone that you just know in passing, it might not be true. And number three is who is saying the misinformation? Not only where are you getting your news from, but who is saying it, right? If the New York Times is saying something, there's a reason they might be saying something. But if they put in their tweets, according to the Gazan Health Ministry, it's probably not correct, right? If you have, you know, another side that's saying, you know, Israel, you know, Israel wants to wipe all Palestinians off the map and it's shared from like Jew hater 420, <laughs> Again, not the right guy. So one, who is sharing it? Two, what is being shared? And three, how is it being shared? What are the other contexts of it? Make sure you do your research before you share it. Learn why it's being shared. Read more into it. Posting something just because you saw it doesn't mean it's true. And a lot of social media companies are now luckily adding, hey, you haven't read this article yet. Are you sure you want to share it? Hey, this is from an account that's been suspended. Are you sure you want to share it? Right? These tips are words to live by, but it is hard. And I'll admit that it's hard to cut through the misinformation, especially because so many people have large followings. But I'll say this, just because you have a large following doesn't mean I want to hear your stance on every conflict. I don't think he's come out and said this. Look, I love Justin Timberlake. I think Justin Timberlake's a phenomenal artist. I love his music. I don't necessarily care about his stance on how to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. He's not an expert on it. He has not studied this for years. He does not have a master's degree in international relations. He's not on the ground there. He's a celebrity. And we've somehow attached, you know, credibility to large followings and celebrity stats. Right. So I know this is kind of a long-winded answer to what you had asked, but again, no, but it's it's important. It, it's important, and I guess like another again, like the a big theme to this show, into this specific episode, is the value of nuance and the value of being a skeptic, not a cynic nor an optimist, but a skeptic. I think another aspect as well that's important to note here is that in an emotionally charged time as this, people are, and I'm going to use this word very intentionally here, desperate. To be right. People are have the emotional need right now to be right to validate this because I don't think I this isn't that Ayal Shea, he was a, a previous speaker on this podcast. He talked about he, you know, he he's a kibbutznik from Israel who talked about that why Jews, well, why some Jews are critical of Israel. He explained that the more he learns, the less he understands. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what a lot of people out there are facing right now, especially as they get bombarded with information left and right, not sure of who they should be listening to, is that they are in this complicated place, especially those who are not um, ethnically attached to the Jewish or the Palestinian or the Israeli cause here, that they want, they need to be right or else they're on the wrong side of history. That's the scariest mm -hmm. thing. History having its eyes on you. And they don't want to be labeled as the 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 villain in this case. They don't want to be able to. They don't want to be the ones to tell their children in the future that we did this wrong. I'll I'll tell you a story. This is actually a little bit of a hot take from my personal experience an account that I had from college. Um, I used to be an intern at San Francisco Hillel when I went to San Francisco State, and we had this big Shabbat uh, event where we actually invited the LGBTQA club over. So the LGBTQA club president, along with uh, his board members, came into our Hillel. And part of the ceremony was changing the bathroom door sign from, uh, you know, specific genders to all gender, all genders welcomed in this bathroom, right? It was a big moment for our communities. It felt like we really connected this bridge of, of ally, you know, we, we created a partnership. We were not allies, right? A week later, GUPS, the General Union for Palestinian Students, had a rally. And in that crowd was the president of the LGBTQA club. 
And what this taught me, he was chanting as well, by the way. He had his fists up in the air. He was chanting, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So the question is, do people who are not who are not connected to this actually care? And the truth of the matter is, I do not think they do. I don't think most people who are not actually related to this care about this. I think they just want to be right. I think we live in an unempowered world that wants to get behind things that make them feel more important. And I think with this situation, it's such an exciting time because it's the closest thing that people can get to the Star Wars narrative. Here you have a power that you could call the Empire and you have another power that you can call the Rebels. Except the Rebels in this story in real life happen to rape and behead children, you know? So, you know, are these really the Rebels you want to root behind? Right. The the major thing here, right, is how the news cycle works and how everything goes on social media. The fact of the matter is this is still one of the top stories on social media after two weeks. That's unheard of in social media land, which means that people are really attached to this. You mentioned earlier, do people really care about this? I think there are plenty of people, even who are not necessarily attached, that do care about this. There are plenty of Palestinian and Israeli activists. There are plenty of people that are constantly shouting from the rooftops, all of these things year round, regardless of what is happening. There are people who organize rallies. There are people who are actively doing educational work. There are people who genuinely do care about this, but a large swath of people either don't care about it or only care when it's convenient. And that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's right. what I'm trying to say. And that's been a big point in this whole discussion of does social media target Jews, right? And the fact of the matter is you'll see a lot of these stories that people are sharing or a lot of people coming out as, you know, things that are happening in Gaza or things are happening in Israel. And a lot of Jews on both sides have essentially said, look, we're not mad at most of you for calling out atrocities that may be happening in Gaza, regardless of whether they're founded or not, regardless of the side of the conflict you're on. We don't want civilian loss of life. I don't know any Israeli who genuinely wants everybody to die all the time. I don't know any Israeli who is cheering for every civilian loss of life. No one is mad that people are coming out saying, hey, I'm really upset that children are dying in Gaza. What everyone's upset about is that they were only speaking about civilian deaths. The only time they have now come to speak about the conflict is after Israel retaliated. These protests erupted after the massacre and before Israeli airstrikes and ground invasions. They happened in the interim where people were saying it was civil resistance and justified. Now that Israel is fighting back, whether you believe that's justified or not, that's when people have come and started to speak out against. And that's why a lot of Jews are afraid and feel unsafe and feel unsupported. No one is saying you're not allowed to express solidarity. We're just upset that you didn't express solidarity with us, that you spent weeks debating the minutia over whether babies were beheaded or just burned alive, yet you trusted Hamas sources immediately, that you're immediately calling for a ceasefire, but not demanding the release of hostages, that you are screaming in the streets, free Palestine, Yet no one was there protesting outside of the Egyptian and Jordanian embassies when they refused to let Palestinians in. No one was protesting outside the Iranian embassy when they massacred other Palestinians. No one was screaming, how dare Hamas dig up water pipes and use them to build rockets. They did not care or voice their concerns whenever the Palestinians were hurt by the Arab world or Palestinian governments, just when Israel did anything. And that's why people feel attacked. That's why people are hurt. Because when we needed solidarity, when our brothers and sisters and mothers and cousins and fathers were murdered brutally, the world stood silent, except for other Jews. And now that there is a conflict, everybody is voicing their opinion. Everybody is now a Middle Eastern activist. Everyone is sharing disinformation. And that's the current state that we're in. And my job as a social media manager for a news agency and what all news agencies should be doing and people who actually know what's happening in the conflict and people that can provide education and actual nuance need to do is cut through it to educate people, to help people have these discussions. 
You are not going to change somebody's mind by arguing with them in the comments. You are by getting on a call with them and talking about it and listening to what's happening and acknowledging other pain. You're not going to change somebody's mind by just sharing a news article. You are going to educate them and allow for open discussion. You are not going to change somebody's mind by posting an infographic that has no history, right? You are going to by giving people information and showing the support and solidarity and the context behind it. There is so much that everyone is dealing with on a daily basis. And you just have to make sure that you're reaching them. And that is the goal of social media managers. Well said, well said. There is one more thing I want to show before we end this podcast. And this might open up a can of worms here, but I have to, <laughs> but I have to, but I have to show this because this is a common, it's probably the most common comment. I'm actually, I, I don't know the statistics on this, but I have a feeling this is probably the most used comment on social media right now. And I'd love to get your insight on this. Let's talk about free Palestine. Let's talk about it. This might be a while. And I realize that me as a Jew, there are plenty of people that are going to be like, well, you're not Palestinian or you're, you don't live there or you don't understand what's going on. One, there are plenty of Zionists who are also pro-Palestinian. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. People either want a two-state solution or they want Palestinians to live free of oppression, regardless of who is oppressing them, while also believing in the right to Jewish self-determination. That's all Zionism is. It's the right to Jewish self-determination in their ancestral homeland. Now, you can debate like the eight types of it, whether you're a modern Zionist, a labor Zionist, a revisionist Zionist. No one ever wants to talk about that nuance, right? But that's all Zionism is. If you believe in right to Jewish self-determination, you're a Zionist. And there are so many people that are going to be mad at me for saying that. But that's what it is. People would like to co-opt it for their own nefarious purposes, but that's not what it is, right? So when you chant free Palestine, what are you saying? First off, when you see those comments, where are they being commented? Are they being commented on Israeli content? Are they being commented on things about the Arab-Israeli conflict? Or more than likely, are they being commented on just Jewish content? I have been a Jewish content creator and social media manager for quite some time at this point, multiple years. And I have seen that comment so many times on content that has nothing to do with Israel. I did a video about what I would teach in Hebrew school and religious school and just random things my kids would say. Did not mention Israel, even said religious school in the headline, didn't even say Hebrew school. And I got free Palestine comments. I would be doing a play about Judaism, about my family that has nothing to do with Israel. And I'd be getting free Palestine comments. So if you're commenting free Palestine on just random Jewish content, you are doing two things. One, you are now equating all the Jewish people to the actions of the Israeli government, which is what the Free Palestinian Movement claims they are not doing. And two, because of that, you are now saying all Jews are responsible for Israel and everything that happens there, which means you are anti-Semitic because you are explicitly saying that the 10-year-old kid who, or the 13-year-old kid who has a bar mitzvah in Ohio is responsible for the IDF, Right. You wouldn't say that about any other group. No one is commenting on Chinese content creators saying free the Uyghurs. No one is commenting on Russian content creators saying stop the war in Ukraine. Because the Russian content creator who lives in the United States and has never fought in the Russian war or has been in the United States their whole life did not invade Ukraine. Right? But somehow when it comes to Israel... When it comes to all Israelis, suddenly the people who have been claiming it's not all or believe these people or whatever are now incredibly xenophobic and they don't want to admit that to themselves. So that's one side of the free Palestine conflict. The other side of it, what are you freeing Palestine from? There is a new call to action on a lot of sides, mainly from the Israeli side and the Jewish side and even the left and right side. Free Palestine from Hamas. Israel has not been in Gaza since 2005. Everyone claims that the occupation started in 1948, which again, delegitimizes Israel's existence. But also, 
Gaza wasn't run by Israel from 1948 to 1967. Neither was the West Bank. It was under Jordanian rule who prevented Palestinians from obtaining citizenship, who prevented Palestinians from joining either country. And currently Jordan is removing Jordanian citizenship from many of the Palestinians that had either gotten the right to be there or in the current refugee camps. Again, no one is talking about that and no one chanting free Palestine is demanding, you know, they also be helped. They're putting the full blame on Israel. So what are you freeing Palestine from? Are you freeing them from Jordanian and Egyptian rule? Are you freeing them from Israeli occupation? Are you freeing them from Hamas? People who chant free Palestine for no other reason other than to either join the movement or because it's a good slogan don't understand why they're chanting it. From the river to the sea does not mean just Palestinian liberation or everyone will live together in peace. It's from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea will all be the land of Palestine. Well, if there's just the land of Palestine, you know, where 50% of the people in Gaza voted to elect Hamas, who wants the destruction of not only Israel, but all Jews, or the Palestinian Authority that has a pay for slay uh, policy that pays families of terrorists who have murdered Jewish civilians money for the rest of their lives. When you have that separate, when you have the Jordanian River, the Mediterranean Sea, what can't be there? What can't exist there? That is not a call for peace. That is not a call for coexistence. That is not a call for everyone to live together in harmony. That is calling for the disillusionment of the state of Israel. Now, if you're commenting free Palestine, specifically on things that are happening within the places of Palestine, if you're seeing Hamas, treat them terribly, and you say free Palestine from Hamas, if you are protesting specific Israeli government policies that, some, that plenty of Israelis also protested, that's slightly different. But Hamas didn't come into Israel and ask if they were one of the good ones. They didn't go in and say, have you protested Netanyahu's policies? They didn't go in and even ask if they were Israeli or Jewish. They just murdered. Palestinian Israelis died. Thai people died. Americans died. People who were not citizens of Israel died. Children died. Leaders of peace movements died. They didn't care. So if you really care about freeing Palestine, this is my less, this is my message to everybody who's commenting that. What are you freeing them from? Do you want people to coexist? Do you want everyone to live together in harmony? Are you actually talking to Palestinian people? Or are you just parroting random messages because you feel it's a movement that you can jump on? And I have to let that sit because I think that you've made that point in a very articulate and strong way. And I want to end the podcast on that high note. I want to end the podcast acknowledging the fact that you came on here. You spoke very articulately. You gave us some great guidelines on how to navigate the world of information and misinformation. And I also want to thank you for, uh, you know, being so put together for the show, even just as my friend, but as someone who is rising up the ranks and authority in the Jewish world. So Kol Hakavod to you. And thank you so much for being on Bad Jew. Izzy, for those who want to reach out and contact you, what's the best way to stay connected? Um, yeah, one of the best ways to stay connected. Uh, I have a Twitter account. It's at Izzy Salant. Uh, you know, I'm the only one on the network. Um, I don't have an Instagram. I don't have a lot of my own social media just because I'm on social media all day working. And so I kind of need a break for myself. Um, you know, you can reach out at JNS. Um, and other than JNS, as great as the organization is, there are a lot of other organizations that you can look out to. Honest Reporting is great for that. A Wider Frame is great for that. Other news agencies, um, as well as reaching out to your local Jewish federations, your local community members going out to your, you know, going out to, you know, not only your community leaders, but your local Jewish communities. They are the people that have the resources. They are the people on the ground. Contact people that are going to Israel to provide aid. Contact your local representatives. Look for people that goal is to make sure everybody's okay. That is looking to make sure that they are educating what's happening. Don't go to people that are just actively trying to sow hate and actively trying to just make this worse. Um, so yeah. And then uh, obviously people can contact you. So if people want to contact me through you, that is also happening. Just wave from down the street. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, Izzy, thanks again for being on Bad Jew. This has been another great episode, and we've learned a lot of information from this show. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Shalom.